Talktainment Radio Worldwide Sound. Talktainmentradio.com. We give you a reason to come. The world's greatest radio. We give you a reason to stay. Radio, the way it should be heard. You got the power. The views and opinions expressed are those of the host and guest and not necessarily those of TalkTainmentRadio.com, the management, the staff, or k e World Network, LLC. Live call-in talk show. Dial 1-877-932-9766 and join the conversation here on TalkTainmentRadio.com. This is the Compensatory Concept with Mr. Neely Fuller, played exclusively on TalkTainmentRadio.com, the world's greatest radio. Radio, the way it should be heard. And now, Mr. Neely Fuller. If you do not understand white supremacy, which is racism, what it is and how it works, everything else that you understand will only confuse you. Only confuse you. Only confuse you. Welcome to TalkTainmentRadio.com. We go where you go, the world's greatest radio. You are now in touch with the compensatory concept with Mr. Neely Fuller Jr. and I am the co-host, Mr. Bobby, and this is Radio the Way It Should Be Heard. Today being Wednesday, the 7th of August, 2019, and because of the overwhelming response to last week's Q&A, uh, we are going to continue al- along that path of Q&A. As you know, Mr. Fuller will address or answer whatever you want to call it, your uh, questions and concerns. We're all, we're all speaking in codification, so you must remember that. And even when you address your, or write your questions, make sure that they are at least following the TSA method, think, speak, and act method, so that we can all stay in the codified way. Um, don't forget, and this is very important, don't forget, for the second hour, to donate. We need to do that. You really need to do that. It's not going to take you but a few seconds to hit the, go to the TalkTainmentRadio.com homepage, hit that go donate button so we can keep this bad boy going because it's really good. It is really good and very informing, and I'm very pleased to announce that the millennials are jumping on the bandwagon. So dig in your pockets so that we can continue to have Mr. Fuller address our concerns. Okay, well, I think that's all I have to do with that on out the way. Let me present to some and introduce to others Mr. Neely Fuller, Jr. Uh, Mr. Fuller, good morning. Good morning. And how are you this morning? I'm still learning. Okay. Uh, I'm jammed up with Gmails. Of course, we will take the phone calls, and Mr. Fuller will address them. You write me. I will at some point read it. I just don't know when because... Uh, Mr. Fuller goes into an explanation and gives many examples of whatever point that uh, he's trying to make to address your concern. So if you write me, it will be. Daryl, as I just wrote you, uh, your question will be asked. I just do not know when because there are many before you. So let's go right in to the program. Mr. Fuller, um, this, oh, one, oh, let me give you the numbers. I'm sorry. one eight seven seven nine three two. 9766 is the contact number, or you can Gmail me at the numeral 7, Mr. Bobby, B O B B Y, at gmail.com. And if you decide to use that method, uh, probably not going to get to your question today, but at some point I will get to your question, and then I will tell you in, in, in referring back to you that your question is being uh, answered or addressed by Mr. Fuller. Okay, with further. D- no, f- well, no further interruptions. Uh, let's go to the Gmails, and this is I test, and he says this, Mr. Fuller. He said, Mr. Fuller, what does the st- strange, gross life of a serial killer, Jeffrey Dahmer, teach us about the system of white supremacy? Well, what was the question? The question was, what does the strange, gross life of serial killer Jeffrey Dahmer teach us about the system of white supremacy? Well, I took it to, as an example of uh, the format for Jeffrey Dahmer, uh, who was a serial killer uh, out of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, I believe, 
killed a lot of black people and had uh, black males for the most part and uh, reportedly had so-called sexual intercourse with their corpses and then chopped up their bodies and stored them in his refrigerator and was eating part of the bodies on a ongoing or intermittent basis, if I have the story correct, if I remember it correctly. And uh, at the time, I told people that Mr. Jeffrey Dahmer was an example of the, the white supremacist system. That's basically the, the root of it. He's an example of it, a very, very explicit example of it. I mean, to be fascinated with particularly dead black bodies, dead black bodies, particularly dead male black bodies. Somehow that's a fascination of the white supremacist man. You look at a, a black person moving around and say that that whatever that is that should be dead, not only be dead, but I should kill it. I should kill it. Nobody else. Me. Uh, they can kill each other and all like that, but that doesn't give me the the boost that I need. That doesn't give me the validity that I need. I need that validity. I need it. I need it. That's the white supremacist uh, mindset. I need this for some strange reason. I don't know the reason. Neely Fuller doesn't know the reason. I'm saying I don't know the reason because I don't. But I'm saying the evidence shows this, that that there yon goes a black male in the form of what some people say is a person. But whatever you call that thing, that, that, that creature moving around, I have a duty to do some kind of harm to it, go out of my way to do harm to it, go looking for it to do harm to it, even when there's no not one around. I mean, if I hear about it somewhere on the planet, I got to go and be fascinated with it and do harm to it and to destroy it and preserve it for you know even in this even in my destructive tendencies. Mr. Jeffrey Dahmer, I understand, was asked, why did he do what he did by the detectives? And he said, I don't know. It's just something that I do. It's just something that I do. And they say, well, <laughs> uh, it's, you know, it's something that you do, and if you were released, uh, would you do it again? And he said, well, I'm pretty certain I will. Even if you release me, I just, you know, is this something that I do? I can't explain it beyond that. Now, this is something that's really happening. This is not fiction. This is something that really happened. I mean, it was numerous bodies. I, I had an article here that I usually kept, but I didn't get a chance to talk about it. I was going to voluntarily talk about it on the air on many occasions. Somehow I misplaced uh, an article talking about Mr. Jeffrey Dahmer. And uh, because I say, just what I'm explaining now, when I read it at that time, which was many years ago, I said, now that is the typical mentality, mm -hmm. the typical ultimate mentality of the white supremacist mind. That is really what it's all about. And it's beyond comprehension mm -hmm. of what we might call uh, uh, the popular mindset or the general mindset of the average person. How the average person would think if they heard a story like that. Okay. I mean, so that that's what I have to say in response to that. Okay. Uh, second question on that uh, for eye test uh, is this. Mr. Fuller, finding good movies to watch in this system is hard to do because of the extreme violence in them. Why are we constantly bombarded with violence in our entertainment? Well, in the system of white supremacy, white supremacy, violence 
is supposed to be normal. They they thrive on it. They thrive on seeing things dead. They 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 are fascinated by death. There's something about death. Death is, you know, you know. There's a, a old saying. I think they call it a, an old Japanese saying. Life begins with death. So, if life begins with death, then life is very short because death is perpetual before you have life, you have death. I think that's what that phrase means, that saying means. So, death is very, very dominant. But to be fascinated with death uh, and, and to worship it and to teach others to worship it, black people right now, particularly young black people coming up, we are taught in the system of white supremacy to worship death, to go around in the neighborhood uh, looking at somebody who looks like you because that's the easy way to go and shoot shoot that person, kill that person, stab that person, beat that person up, do some type of harm and try to make that person dead. This, this is the philosophy of the white supremacists. Worship in death. Make movies about people killing. Murder this. Murder that. Uh, this is this type of murder. Have you heard this murder story? <clears throat> There's a new murder mystery coming out. Make sure that you go to the theaters and see it. There's more murders in this particular movie than have ever, you, uh, of any murder mystery movie you have ever seen. And more different types of murders. Who done it? I mean, and murder all over the place. Be sure and see this movie. And there's another book coming out. And it's it's it's, it's a book. I mean, it's a, a, it's it's a composite of every type of murder that you can possibly think of. Murders that never been heard of before. Everybody needs this book on their shelf right now. You got to get it. Rush out and get this book before they sell out, because there's no murder mystery book the equal of this particular murder mystery book. This type of thing. I'm just giving illustrations of the mindset. Yes, sir. And the evidence is all around you. Go into a bookstore. If you want to find something about growing something or building something, that's back there in that little old dinky place called uh, Crafts and and handyman stuff and, you know, how to build a tool shed, uh, how to run a railroad. Mm -hmm. Now, that's that's back there in the back of the book in that special section back there, back of the bookstore. But all your glossy 800 pages of murder is right up front, right there in the window. Great, big, beautiful, glossy books. I mean, $87 a copy. Get them now. They're flying off the shelves. I mean, you better get them now because they won't be available, I mean, for very long until we go to the second publication. Mm -hmm. Yes. In answer to the question, yes. In the system of white supremacy, murder is worshipped. Dead bodies are worshipped. Body counts. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Talktame at Radio.com is a 24-7, no-charge worldwide broadcasting facility with hosts delivering on various topics such as news, lifestyle, uh, sports, law, health, wellness, religion, and politics. And here's a few that I'm going to share with you. Uh, This is Libby with Libby Rand. Uh, Wiggins World uh, with Stacy Wiggins. As a matter of fact, I think he's going to be on her show uh, coming up, and Stacy deals with 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 uh, wellness and all kind of health things. Uh, very very good. You ought to give it a listen. And of course, uh, one of my favorites is uh, everybody knows this is new money, and boy, do we need to understand that. But here's the point: all these shows are exclusive to, to TalkTainmentRadio dot com, and all you have to do is go to the uh, uh, TalkTainmentRadio dot com homepage and click on programs, and then there you will see a current list of all the programs that TalkTainmentRadio.com has to offer. Just click on it and give it a sample and see if you like it, or if you don't, you can uh, subscribe to it or like it, whatever you want to do. But remember, all this comes from TalkTainmentRadio.com, radio the way it should be heard. My name is Mr. Bobby. 
I am the co-host on the compensatory concept with Mr. Neely Fuller, Jr. I also neglected to tell you that we can be seen and heard on the YouTube channel. Sorry about that, but all you have to do is go to the YouTube channel and type in the word uh, Talktainment, and then there's a place for you to talk, <laughs> type in the word radio, and then scroll down and um, type in Talktainment number two, and then there you can see us, uh, see me rather, and um, and hear the program. You can also go to uh, facebook.com forward slash Talktainment if you want to hear the entire show. Some people want to hear themselves. You can also do it this way, as you're doing now. Uh, listen to it by going to the TalkTainmentRadio.com homepage and just click on Listen Live, and you're there, and you're there. one eight seven seven nine three two nine seven six six or the numeral 7, Mr. Bobby, B-O-B-B-Y, at uh, gmail.com. Uh, we are taking uh, the focus here is Q&A again because we have an overwhelming response to it from last week, so we're going to continue. Mr. Fuller, this comes from, let's see here, uh, Brother Thompson. He says this, Mr. Fuller, I wanted to say something about how the code handles the issue of sex. Others may say the same. I'm not criticizing it. It's just very few people these days are going to tell a sex partner or partners and there are there is a bunch of that going on how many people and who they have been with before engaging in sex people are oh i'm sorry people are stressed and many times drunk and or high on drugs so that they are not thinking clearly or they simply are horny and want somebody uh these days we're lucky if people even use protection and there are more STDs than ever now since whites bring them from the animal kingdom that they are also a part of. It's If everyone revealed all of their sex partners before having sex, then no one would be having sex except maybe the remaining virgins on the planet. It's just not practical in uh, today's environment. Ideal, but not practical. Mr. Fuller, you care to respond to that? In other words, uh, if I'm getting it, uh, it's a lot there that was said, and uh, I didn't get the the, he was, the essence of the question. He was speaking of sex partners, uh, and the be, be, before people having a, a sex, uh, ex, exposing or telling how many people that they've had uh, a, a sexual intercourse with, uh, or whatever sexual encounters, he said that people aren't honest anymore. And he said, although the idea is practical to sit down and talk, I mean, the, but he said, but it's not going to happen for the most part. Well, if it's not going to happen, then you you take the consequences of it not happening. Because all that, the reason I put this in the book, that if you have a sex partner, and this is for the future because, uh, you know, the book was, this was the updated version of the 1984 uh, edition of the textbook for victims of white supremacy. So in the eighth area of activity, I have a section where I say that before people engage in their first sexual act, and I address this to non-white people all over the world, that they should know everything that there is to know so that they don't ever say, I wish I had known, I, uh, or I could, if, if I had known, or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Everything that you can possibly find out about that person that you're going to have sexual intercourse with should be known. This, this is in the 2016 edition, because between the interim of 1984 and 2016, uh, I hadn't thought of a list of questions that should have been asked, that should be asked. I hadn't thought of it at all. But by 2016, I had been thinking about it for some years, and I said, the three words that kept coming up, and people saying they can't get along with somebody or that 
they got to get a divorce or that uh, all of the fights that go on and whatnot. I mean, the brutality that goes on between male with female, uh, the male uh, beating up the female about this, that, and other. I mean, black people screaming and yelling at each other all the time. It comes from lack of knowledge and understanding. I came to that conclusion over the years of this story after story, all the stories that I was familiar with and everything that I could think of going way back. Why do people get together and then break up? I mean, they're all glassy-eyed and whatnot when they get together, but there's a reason why they break up. And so the reason is you didn't know what you should have known about the other person. That's the only reason. That's the only reason these breakups happen. And and this, these three words, uh, I didn't know. Yes. Or, uh, to paraphrase, I should have known. Mm-hmm. Or if I had known. Mm-hmm. If I had known that you uh, did this, or you were like this, mm-hmm. or that would make you mad, or that you were on parole. So I'm saying the first thing you want out of the way is every question dealing with sex that you could possibly ever ask a person or ever want to know about a person, that should take place before the first act of sexual intercourse happens. For one thing, it'll slow everything down to a crawl. It sure because will. A lot mm-hmm. of people won't, don't want to reveal things right. about themselves. Correct. Or you all chomp, you know, chomping at the bit to get rid of each other. Correct. Well, the code book, the way I've written it, you do have that option. I mean, it's between you and, and your partner. But I'm saying, like I said, beginning of the answer to this question, be ready for the failure in that so-called relationship, particularly where black females are concerned. Because black females are, are saying that we are desperate to have some type of real relationship with somebody. We're sick of this mess. It's nothing but just a mess. One just mess, one mess spread after another. Even among people who are celebrities and whatnot, nobody, for the most part, is getting along for fifteen minutes. I mean, it's just you know, so-called relationships between black males and black females almost non-existent. Mm-hmm. Okay. I mean, it's just it's just nothing to it. No, no substance at all. Yes, sir. Okay. I mean, you know. Completely rotten inside and out. Mm-hmm. And why is this? There's a reason for it. Lack of knowledge and understanding of the person you're with before that first act of sexual intercourse. That is where the problem is. Mm-hmm. That is where the problem is. It's not really serious. So you can sit and have coffee or whatever you do. I mean, uh, hold hands and whatnot and talk about the state of the world. You can do that forever. But once you have that first act of sexual intercourse, then you consider yourself in some type of relationship. And if you don't know everything that there is to know about that person, you don't have a question mark anywhere. The conjecture is, according to the code, according to what I have written, now you are risking getting into something that's going to be fatalistic and going to be sorry for down the road somewhere. Okay. We have to be just that strict with ourselves and each other that whomever you get in bed with, I mean, and you say that you are going to have sexual intercourse with that person, it shouldn't be any complaints about anything ever after you get out of that bed. Oh, right. that, that is the conjecture. That's the conjecture. That is the code. Okay. There shouldn't be a, not a single complaint. I mean, Next week, a week after that, 10 weeks after that, 40 years after that, it shouldn't be not one complaint. Oh. Why? Mm-hmm. Because complaints come from lack of knowledge of who you are with. All righty. So you're supposed to know everything that there is to know. All righty. I'm talking about everything. It shouldn't be nothing that you don't know. Okay. All about, right. About the person that you are with. Okay, George, there you go, the answer to your question. Let's take a phone call here. Caller, you are now on, and you can be heard with Mr. Fuller. Go ahead, please. All righty, peace. Good morning, Mr. Bobby and Mr. Fuller. Uh, this is Mass Source Celestine calling again uh, from D.C. And uh, I want to ask a question about the uh, revised expanded edition on page 421. 
on the Revised Expanded Edition, the second line from the very bottom, it says, study yourself. Ask yourself, is there any logical reason why anyone would want to spend most of his or her time in your presence? And I ask, ask myself that question. Honestly, I can say there is no logical reason why anyone would want to spend much time, let alone much, uh, most of their time in my presence. So I want to ask you, Mr. Fuller, what is the code of five response? What are some logical reasons why someone would want to spend most of his or her time in your presence? And I have another question, too. Oh, you mean in my presence? Are you talking about well, Julie Fuller? Well, I, maybe yours or any uh, average uh, victim or uh, prisoner of war or uh, victim of white supremacy. Oh, well, uh, I think like if, that. well, in my, okay, if I understand the question, I think, you know, that's why I put it in there. Every person should ask that question. Why would anybody want to spend any time with me? Now, every I black person on the planet, right this minute, should ask that question. Why would anybody, anywhere, want to spend, come looking for me, to spend time Time is very important. It's one time is one thing we all have. We are here. Spend time with me. Spend time doing what? Whatever you're going to do. But why would anybody want to spend time with me? Talking to me. Walking down the street with me. Be seen with me. Why would anybody want to do that? Anybody anywhere in the world. Now, every black person on the planet right this minute should ask him or herself that question and give him or herself an honest answer. I mean, if you want to, just go and stand in front of the mirror and think about yourself. Think about everything that you know, everything that you do, everything you believe in, how you look right now, right this minute. Every black person, male and female, a lot of males, go stand and look in the mirror right now and ask yourself, at first sight, why would anybody anywhere on the planet come looking for me to spend precious time with me? For what reason? For whatever reason. You can just name what, I mean, you name the reason, you're asking yourself the question. So why would anybody want to spend time with me? I'm looking at me in the mirror. Why would anybody, at first sight, even, passing, you know, looking at me on the subway or wherever, just all of a sudden say, boy, that's somebody I really want to talk to. Why would anybody want to do that? Ask yourself that about yourself. And give yourself an honest answer. Take a good look at who you are and what you do and what you believe in and ask yourself why anybody would want to spend 10 minutes in your presence. Because I do it. And you know what I came up with? I couldn't think of a reason at all. Me neither. None. Honestly. None. See, I'm honest with myself. None. <laughs> Zero. <laughs> Zilch. <laughs> Minus zero. Zero into infinity. I can't think of any reason. <laughs> My second question is, Mr. Fuller, it seems like we are being deliberately, uh, constantly deliberately inundated and traumatized with the rep repetitive news of black people being killed on the news, which causes a lot of non-constructive uh, behavior and confusion. What should be our codified, or codified response towards uh, news, a constant barrage of uh black people being killed around this country and around the world? Oh, uh, to stop killing. That, that should be it. And how do we stop that? For one thing, don't make non-constructive contacts. Make every contact, and of course I just finished talking about why would a person want to talk to Neely Fuller? Why, would, why does any person want to talk to any other person? Period. That's a question. And the answer should be, the logical and constructive answer should be always, and you make constructive contacts. Otherwise, you don't make any contact with anybody, anywhere, at any time. Always make every contact, deliberate contact that you make with each and every person that you contact, have in mind 
that you're going to produce a constructive result from that contact. If you don't have it in mind, something that's going to happen, that's going to have a constructive result, you don't have any business, according to the code, based on logic, making contact with any creature on the planet, anytime. That, that's the whole purpose of the code. Every contact should have a constructive result. You're making contacts with people. I would like to talk to you. The black guy standing out in front of the liquor store. This is one that I've used down for years. Hey, baby. <laughs> don't you want to talk to me? <laughs> See, that's contact. <laughs> All right. So where is the logical question? that she should ask. He asked the question. See, I'm saying all, everything is resolved through questions and answers. Now, he's asking, hey, baby, don't you want to talk to me? <laughs> all right? Now, an excellent response to that is, talk to you for what? In other words, she has a question. He doesn't know whether, you know, uh, he, he's making the approach. So evidently he's making an offer, all right? Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm offering you something. I'm offering you a chance to talk to me. Hey, baby, don't you want, talking about want now, that four-letter word, W-A-N-T, <laughs> that we talk about on page 171. I finally got that correct. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Out of my foggy mind, That's I right. kept saying 117 is 171 okay. of the textbook. That word want. Hey, baby, don't you want to talk to me? How many times have I heard that, particularly in the old days? Okay. Talk to you about what? For what? See, it might be about four or five questions that come before, you know, because the talk now has already started. Yes. See, so, but... It should be in the form of a question. Talk to you about what in order to accomplish what? Hmm. How about that? <laughs> yeah. Now, and let him answer according to whatever he made his first pitch for. Because mm -hmm. he's talking about once. Mm -hmm. Here's a lady passing by that he doesn't know, but he's coming out of a door, and he says, Hey, baby, don't you want to talk to me? Well, in polite conversation, I mean, you know, well, well, maybe, yes, maybe not. <laughs> Talk to you about what? In order to accomplish what? <laughs> what is anybody going to get out of talking to you? Mm -hmm. Why are you out of all the people on the planet? Why not the fellow standing down on the next block <laughs> at the bus stop and not you? Okay. Why are you? Yeah. All right. He should be ready with a constructive answer. Yes. If he's not, he ought to go somewhere and find a constructive answer to that question. Okay, yes, sir. But All right. <laughs> All righty. Uh, Mr. Uh, Jim Dennison, I'm going to ask your question via the uh, Gmail after I have Mr. Fuller address uh, his book. We're a little ahead of time here, but... But uh, I'm still revolutionary in, in Hey Baby, at least the way that you said it, Mr. Fuller. But anyway, this is the time that we dedicate for Mr. Fuller's book. But let me read this first. Uh, TalkTainmentRadio.com, we go where you go. Download the TalkTainmentRadio.com app to your cellar, to your tablet. That's radio the way it should be heard. My name is Mr. Bobby, the co-host on the Compensatory Concept with Mr. Nelly Fuller, Jr. Um, our topic today is the Q&A number two. Uh, having Mr. Fuller address your questions and uh, answers to your uh, questions. one eight seven seven nine three two nine seven six six or 7, the numeral 7, Mr. Bobby at gmail.com. Now, here we go. This is the point of the, t of the uh, show that we have Mr. Fuller address his book, which was slightly addressed earlier. Mr. Fuller, go ahead about your book. Yes, you can get the book by going to producejustice.com. That's ProduceJustice.com. ProduceJustice.com. Because that's what we're supposed to be trying to produce, theoretically. If you're going to have a world that's out of balance, where people are out of balance with each other, mm -hmm. the reason 
probably is a lack of justice. So what is justice? Guaranteeing that no person is mistreated and guaranteeing that the person that needs help the most gets the most constructive help. But you can't have justice and a system of racism on the same planet at the same time. That is absolutely impossible. If you have a system of racism anywhere on the planet, you cannot have justice anywhere on the planet. You can't have white supremacy and justice on the same planet at the same time. That is absolutely impossible because justice means guaranteeing that no person is mistreated. And white supremacy means a whole lot of people are going to be mistreated. That's what it's designed to do. Okay? That's what white supremacy means, mistreating people of color. So that's a guarantee. That's what it's made for. Otherwise, you couldn't even call it that. That would be a misnomer. Okay? But the book is about replacing the system of white supremacy with the system of justice and using yourself as an individual person, as an agent of doing that and how to go about doing it each and every day. We've talked about some of the ways right today. I mean, you don't talk to a person unless you have a constructive reason. That would go a long ways in stopping black people talking about killing, from killing each other to start with. Right away, the killing would, would almost come to a standstill. Just that. Think about it. I want to re- I want to harp on that for a minute because that's really important. That's what the book is about. I want you to have the book, but it's a guideline for reaching that. And the main one of the main suggestions, these are just suggestions in the book, is don't make contact with anybody without a constructive reason for doing so. Now, black people make contacts all the time. We love make kind, making contact. All that hugging and high-fiving and whatnot, we love making contact. But our contacts are poisonous. We have to admit that. We all carry poison. I carry poison. And we spread that poison. But if we start coming up with a code where we don't make contact with anybody without a constructive reason for doing so mm-hmm. and being able to explain that reason, that will, overnight, a lot of this stuff that you hear about killing black people, killing black people, black on black crime and all like that, that would be greatly reduced and almost come to a standstill. It would stop. Okay. It would just go because in order to do anything with anybody, you first got to make contact. Okay. The book says no contact, no conflict. So go to producejustice.com. That's how to get the book. Okay. Uh, b- before I ask Jim Dennison's questions, Mr. Fuller, uh, let me ask you this. Uh, you can just briefly answer this. If one of the persons on the morning show of uh, Joe Scarborough of MSNBC wanted you to come on national TV and discuss the compensatory concept or speak about your your book, would you, Neely Fuller Jr., go on national TV to discuss your book to solve the race problem? Would I go on television? Yes, MSNBC in particular. Uh, um, I People have asked me about that, and I have thought about you know that venue and all that down through the years. But I have avoided television, mm-hmm. period. And I uh, don't particularly like to be on a, in a talk show. Why? Because I say that black people should become their own leaders. Yes. And black people have a tendency, and the white supremacists have done this to us, to always be looking for someone who is their leader. We, we, we are trained that way, looking mm-hmm. for a leader, constantly looking for a leader, a messiah, or somebody to, you know, you know, to do all the talk for us without us doing any talking for ourselves. But the compensatory uh, code says every black person should become a leader. A leader of whom? 
him or herself. I say it doesn't get any better than that. Okay, but but I'm asking uh, since they everybody's asking well, how do we solve the race problem? And obviously you had just spoken about your book. There's a, maybe there's a lot of people that don't know, and. Oh, yes, I want people to know about that. Oh, okay, so would you go on the national TV, MSNBC, to speak specifically about your book on how to solve the race problem? I would rather somebody else did that. But if because, they, okay. see, I don't want the okay. focus to be on me. Okay, I got you. I want the focus to be on the concept, the United Independent Compensatory Code System concept. Okay. Because I think this is a huge breakthrough. I mean, we don't have to drag on with this race problem, I mean, any longer. I think we can take care of this entire race problem overnight. That ah, is my okay, goal okay. with this book. Okay. And I think that if people know about the book and start following and testing, uh, this is very important. I want people to test the things that are written in this okay. book. Okay, agreed. To okay. put them to a test, each okay. individual. Okay. And see if it works for them as individuals. Okay. I because agree. that's the whole concept. I agree with that. But I ask that because you wrote the book and you said that all problems are solved through questions and answers. So they can't really ask anybody else but you because you wrote the book. And that's why if they wanted you to come on TV because you wrote the book, they would have a chance to ask you the question of how to solve the race problem, which you just did a few moments ago in discussing your book. Yes, but this can be done through this venue. I'm doing this right now. Yes, you are doing it right I'm now. I'm doing it right here yes. on TalkTainmentRadio.com. Okay, okay, okay. All I right, I but, w but I would like for people to amplify the existence of the book and the concept, not just Neely Puller's book. See, we don't, we don't have a concept of how to approach the race problem in a different way from what we have been doing. Oh, okay, I got it, okay. Yeah. Uh, this... And this is the reason. I, I want to de-emphasize the personality thing. Okay. I mean, people looking for that, you know, three or four or five or, or 200 black leaders that know everything and can solve everything and be the spokesperson for everything. No, be your own spokesperson. Okay. Got it doesn't it. get any better than that. Okay. Be to know what to say that's even better than what Neely Fuller is saying. Gotcha. See, okay. that should be the goal. <laughs> All righty. Um, this comes from Jim Dennison. Caller, hang on, because I said I would do Jim's question first. Um, he said his, his name is Jim. He said, Mr. Fuller, he said, which of the nine areas should be attacked first to change? Also, which is the hardest, then the easiest? Thank you. Which is the hardest? He said, uh, which of the nine areas of people activity should be attacked first to change, and also which is the hardest, then the easiest? Oh, all of them. Economics, education, these are the nine areas. They are all equal. See, and, and you've got to attack them all at once because they're all interconnected. In fact, if you solve the problems in one area of activity, or I'll say in eight areas of activity, and don't solve the problem in the ninth area, all of the other eight areas, the ones that are left, are going to become unraveled. Why? Because it's, they're all connected. See, economics is connected with education. Mm -hmm. Education is connected with uh, entertainment. In alphabetical order now, I'm going. Entertainment is connected with labor, law, politics, religion, sex, war. They're all interconnected. If you touch any one of these areas of activity, it's going to affect every other area. They're not disconnected. Okay. These are just labels for, for the fabric of cloth that is all one piece. If you touch any part of that suit of clothing... You're touching the whole suit of clothing, you might say. See what I mean? Yes, sir. And that's the way that works. Okay. Just like the universe itself. The universe itself is all connected. Every grain of sand is connected with every drop of water, either directly or indirectly. Okay. I mean, this is the way you have to look at it. Already. So you have to correct every area of activity. Otherwise.
otherwise you're not going to be able to correct any area of activity. All right. And you do it all simultaneously. Simultaneously. Okay, Jim, there you go. Um, you can look it up since you say it's here at work now, but uh, uh, he's already addressed that. Okay, caller, you are now on with Mr. Neely Fuller, Jr. You can be heard. What is your question? Is this me? Yes, sir. Hello? Hello, yes, I uh, can hear you. I, just, I, I just wanted to ask a question. I have been studying um, racism, white supremacy, since I came across the code, actually by Dr. Welsing's recommendation, since uh, I read her Crest Theory of Color Confrontation um, and all of her works, and she had indicated that the code should be recommended reading. So I got that in the mid-'80s. And since then, I've studied a lot of scholars, and me, per I don't see a way to defeat white supremacy. So I wanted to ask Mr. Fuller if there was a way other than to sit back and maybe wait for the system to implode on itself. Because we, we don't seem to be putting a dent in it. That's why I wrote my book. I say that right. black people can do it, the non-white people of the planet, and do it overnight if we just have a code. I say that's the missing link. I could be incorrect in that analysis. But I came to that conclusion back in the 1950s, immediately, when I looked at the world situation. The problem seems to be how to get black people to accept or codify themselves in a large-scale type way so that it, it, you know, it takes effect across the board. They, they don't seem to want to go in that direction. That is the failure on my part, Neely Fuller's part, because... I asked someone, or rather in a con conversation once, someone asked, uh, said to me, uh, someone came to me and, and said that they had the solution to the race problem. And I thought about that for about a fraction of a second. And I said, that's impossible for you to have the solution to the race problem. And he said, why? And I said, how can you have the solution to the race problem, and I have the problem. See, that's the logic. Everything in, 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 in doing anything that's successful is scientific. And that's the scientific answer. And so Mr. Neely Fuller. Fuller has written, so in answer to your question, Neely Fuller has written a book with the purpose of solving the race problem. But what you're saying, sir, is correct. Neely Fuller has not figured out how to get people to listen to him or, or pay attention to the book that he wrote. I haven't but figured out how to do that, which means I don't have a solution either. Because right. it's, it's, it, the solution is, the only way you know the solution to a problem is that the problem has been solved. That's the only way you can claim that you have a solution. And and that that's, that, hey, that's what you got to go up against, including Neely Fuller. You can't cut him no slack either. He wrote a book, but in answer to your question, Neely Fuller does not have a solution to the race problem either. And and he's got a concept, but everybody's walking around talking about, I got a concept, or I got a book, or I got this, or I got that, or, you know, uh, I'm in touch with all of our ancestors and whatnot, and my, I was... And my ancestors told me in a prayer last night, it came to me what the solution to the race problem is. You don't have nothing, sir or ma'am, at all, because the problem is still here. The only proof that you have a solution is that the problem doesn't exist. And that goes for you, too, Neely Fuller, with your book. But, but so, Because I can't I think... get people to read my book, and that, and that is a failure on my part. That's a failure on Neely Fuller's part because I say that's the missing link. That's that's my claim. If we do what is in this book, I say the problem will be solved. If just a handful of black people start doing it, I mean, you know, it, because it will spread. And once it spreads, I mean, I say that it's all over and it'll be over in record time because I say that what I have in the code book is the missing link. We've tried everything but this. The individual person taking the initiative, 
without sitting on a log, looking up at the sky, looking down the road, waiting on somebody else. But what you do every day, if you codify it, if every black person or a significant number of non-white people throughout the planet codify their thoughts, their speech, and their actions, so it's certain things you do, certain things you don't do each and every day, Got the white supremacist system will collapse. Okay. Got to leave it like there. I am so hours. sorry to break it off, but I got to leave it there. Thank yes, you, caller. Thank you, Mr. Fuller. Talk I agree. Talk to him at radio.com, the world's greatest radio. Radio the way it should be heard. Don't go anywhere. Stick and stay. Stay tuned for the second hour of the compensatory concept here on talktamedradio.com, radio the way it should be heard. Thanks for listening to The Compensatory Concept with Mr. Neely Fuller, heard exclusively on TalkTainmentRadio.com, the world's greatest radio. The most important question in all racial matters is why. One should always ask it. Radio, the way it should be heard. You've got the power. The world's greatest radio. TalkTainmentRadio.com This is the Compensatory Concept with Mr. Neely Fuller, heard exclusively on TalkTainmentRadio.com, the world's greatest radio. Radio, the way it should be heard. And now... Mr. Neely Fuller. If you do not understand white supremacy, which is racism, what it is and how it works, everything else that you understand will only confuse you. Only confuse you. Only confuse you. All righty. Welcome to the second hour of the compensatory concept with Mr. Neely Fuller, Jr. Here on TalkTainmentRadio.com, the uncut version. <laughs> We go where you go on the world's greatest radio. You're now in touch with the compensatory concept. And I am your co-host, Mr. Bobby, and this is Radio the Way It Should Be Heard. Our topic uh, this week is a second topic in a row of a Q&A with Mr. Fuller. He will answer and address your call, uh, questions and, and give you an answer. Remember, we are all learning, still learning, how to think in a codified way, and we need to practice codification Every a single day, taking your phone calls at one eight seven seven nine three two nine seven six six. You can also view the program on thank you uh, on um, YouTube uh, by going to the YouTube channel. Uh, that is uh, the uh, the YouTube channel. Uh, type in the word uh, talktainment, then uh, radio, and then scroll down to uh, talktainment number two and. You are uh, there. Uh, and then for us, you can just go to the TalkTainmentRadio.com homepage and hit Listen Alive, and you're right there. We would prefer that you would do that, by the way. Subscribe and like that button. And also, um, Facebook.com forward slash TalkTainment. You can hear the entire program. And, of course, if you want to speak with me or have Mr. Fuller, rather, answer your questions. 7, Mr. Bobby, B-O-B-B-Y at gmail, uh, dot com. All right, one eight seven seven nine three two nine seven six six. Uh let's go to the Gmails. Uh Brother Thompson has this. Um uh, Mr. Fuller. When black males and black females get together for social reasons and they end up having sex, the female usually expects some type of ongoing relationship in return or at least to keep having sex on a regular basis. When that doesn't happen, they get furious because they thought it was more than a one-night stand. Mr. Fuller, what does the code say about expecting a relationship from a one-night stand? From what I've read, they should not even be having sex, but since they are already, what does the code recommend? Should they just avoid each other since the black male did not want a relationship beyond friends with benefits? Thank you. Uh, thank God I don't date. Uh, this comes from Brother brother George. Mr. Fuller? In answer to the question, what we covered earlier in the first hour, and that is, not enough questions were asked and answered before you got in bed in the first place. See, uh, disappointment comes from expectation. 
and expectation and disappointment are linked. You expect something to happen, and then it doesn't happen. Why? Why is it that your expectation was something that resulted in something that didn't happen? It's because you didn't have answers to questions. Why didn't you have answers to questions? The questions weren't asked. See, I mean, it should be very clear to everybody before you get in that bed. This is strictly a one-night stand for the most part, unless we got some kind of footnote, you know, uh, that, hey, if we like each other enough from this one-night stand, it might be a two-night stand or 10,000-night stand or no-night stand. But right now, it's going to be a one-night stand, and that's got to be understood from the beginning, all right? <laughs> that, that, and, and how is that understood? Because it was made clear from the beginning. What did I say in the first hour according to the code? According to the code, this is scientific. Lack of knowledge and understanding. This is what causes all arguments. And lack of knowledge and understanding comes from not enough questions being asked and answered. That's in any setting. Male with female, uh, a person on a job with the foreman of the job. Not enough questions and answers. Not enough questions and answers. All conflict comes from not enough questions and answers made before the conflict can evolve. Because all conflict comes from a misunderstanding, a breakdown in what people expected to happen and becoming disappointed when it didn't happen. And that that is every day, all day. Okay. And it always comes from not enough questions asked in advance with not enough truthful answers given, because if it's not a truthful answer, it's not an answer. All right? All right. So that's the the key. That's the key to everything. You want plenty of questions, thousands of questions if necessary. And then you make moves. Okay. Because then there's no lack of knowledge and understanding. Oh, okay. Thank you for your question. All right, um, Mr. Fuller, this comes from the brother from uh, the so-called concept called French Guiana, Brother Mitro, or Murto. He says this, Can Mr. Fuller explain, give more details concerning the first paragraph of the summary page 182 of the first edition of the code. I think it says this, as long as white supremacy exists, it is correct for non-white males and females to spend a very minimum amount of time, energy, money, etc., entertaining each other and or seeking, quote, personal attention, end of quote, from each other. Sincerely yours, Brother Mitro, from the so-called French Guiana, or French, yeah. Page 181. He said page 182 of the first edition, and I do not have that copy. I have it here. Okay. And uh, and what else did he say? I want you to explain in detail uh, what was written in here. As long as white supremacy exists, it is correct for non-white males and females to spend a very minimum amount of time, energy, money, etc., entertaining each other and or seeking personal attention from each other. And he wants to know the reason for it. Uh, Yes. Because now you're not paying attention to the system of white supremacy. This is all about you and you're a possible mate. And I give the uh, movie Casablanca, uh, which is my favorite movie, by the way. I talk about Godfather 1 and 2 a lot and Shawshank Redemption. But actually, Casablanca is my favorite movie. And it's a favorite movie because it has a lot of lessons in it. And one of the lessons is that the principal characters in the movie all trying to get together 
a male with a female, and because they are just what you might call crazy about each other, and at their wit's end, and they want to be with each other and spend time with each other and be with each other all the time and entertain each other all the time, but at the end of the movie, the characters agree that there is something bigger than them. That's one of the main messages of that movie, Casablanca. Uh huh. All right. On that tarmac, Rick Blaine, played by the character Humphrey Bogart, and uh, Miss Bergman, played the part of somebody named Ilsa, I believe. And uh, they're talking there. And he said, the problems of these people right here, meaning me and you, and your husband, I mean, you know, these are three people trying to work out their own personal problems. They don't amount to a hill of beans in this crazy mixed up world because we got a job to do. We got a job to do, all of us, all three of us, that's much bigger than anything that we think is all that important to us because nothing that we do is going to matter if we don't do this job. Now, the reason I wrote that in the textbook, that that spending all your time being gaga about each other and keeping your eye on the prize, so to speak, which is replacing the system of racism with justice, that should be the priority for any two people that get together or, or to do anything. Ultimately, that's what it's really all about. Why? Because if you don't straighten out that, nothing that you do is going to work anyway. That's what the characters in the movie Casablanca were saying. Say, yeah, we can get all wrapped up in each other, but with the world falling apart around us, we're not going to have a world to be in with each other. So we better devote our time, entertain ourselves, by working on this, solving this problem with the Nazis. Now, that was the message in that particular movie. We got to win this war. It's more important than how we feel about each other, all wrapped up and talking about whining and dining and all like that. We're not going to have be whining and dining or doing anything that matters if we don't take care of the umbrella, the world situation. We can do that. We can devote our time to that. And that will be our togetherness. Since we want to be together, our togetherness will be being together on that wavelength of solving this problem, this major problem of the world at war. Okay? Now, as applied to black people, that's why that's in the area of sex. Black people, male with female or whatever, getting together with each other. But they should keep in mind, hey, whatever we do with each other ain't going to amount to a hill of beans if we don't solve this race problem, period. That should be our priority. That's our reason for getting together. Yes, sir. Otherwise, we don't have no business together. Okay. That's the message. That's the message. Okay, TalkTameAtRadio.com is a 24-7, no-charge, worldwide broadcasting facility with hosts delivering on various topics such as news, lifestyle, sports, law, health, wellness, religion, and politics. And here's a few that I'm going to share with you. Stairway to Heaven with Claude. Talking Sports with Mr. Bobby. Talking Sports Plus with Mr. Bobby. In fact, we did a show uh, last night. Every uh, two weeks we do one. And how about this? If you like to travel, it's your time to travel with Ricky Tice. Now listen, all of these programs are exclusive to TalkTamedRadio.com. And all you have to do is simply go on to the TalkTamedRadio.com homepage. Do it. Click on programs and get a sample of how each program is. And that way you can make a decision whether you like it or don't or whatever you want to do with it. But you're not going to know unless you sample it. So give it a sample with it. And by the way, while you're there, this wasn't on the paper, but while you're there for the compensatory concept second hour, 
Go ahead, ma'am. Go ahead, sir. Hit that gold donate button. Oh, yes, yeah, so we can keep this bad boy going. Anyway, all this is from TalkTeamAtRadio.com. Radio, the way it should be heard. Again, my name is Mr. Bobby. I'm the co-host on the Compensatory Concept with Mr. Neely Fuller, Jr. We are discussing uh, the uh, questions that was asked uh, or the focus that was ask, asked last week. Q&A with Mr. Neely Fuller, Jr. And it is going so well that we extended it to this second uh, 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 program, and it could possibly be the third, and you are beginning to ask real good questions. So thank you. With that being said, let's go to the phone lines. Caller, you are now on with Mr. Fuller. You can be heard. What is your question? Yes, thank you for taking my call. Um, so, Mr. Fuller, ever since I was a young child, um, I've always asked people a lot of questions. And particularly among black people, whether it be family or acquaintances in the workplace, different areas of activity, um, I've always been, it's been said to me often, you ask too many questions, you know, or you're nosy and things like that. So, and I know that you can't speak for, you know, different people and why they ask, they may respond to a question the way that they do, but I'm wondering if you could venture to answer why black people seem to be, to shy away from answering questions that they're asked, um, whether it be a personal question, you know, about their life or, or something like that, or whether it be a question dealing with education or, or you know, or something in the workplace of trying to, when a person is trying to learn something and is asked someone else, you know, for information, why do black people tend to shy away from answering questions? You can ask the black people. That's a question. See, the code says all problems, including all the... And this includes the problem of black people not wanting to be asked questions or they don't want to answer questions. All problems, all problems, all problems are solved through the process of questions and answers throughout the entire universe. Questions and answers, that's the only way you can solve a problem. Actually, when you say you're going to school, quote, unquote, school, what is a school? It's a place where you go or a gathering that you have where people do what? Ask questions and get answers to the questions asked. All problems, without exception throughout the entire universe have always been solved through the process of questions and answers. So specifically in answer to your question about why black people tend to say, I don't want to answer that or don't ask so many questions, you, you got to ask another question, and you ask for permission to ask that question, and that is a question. Well, can I have permission to ask you one more question? When they say you're asking too many questions, I'm giving this as an illustration. You say, hey, hey, lady, you're asking too many questions. Then you say, well, do I? can I get your permission to ask this one more question? Ask for that. And if they say yes, then your question is going to be what, logically speaking? How many questions are too many? <laughs> yes, you just ask them. How many questions are too many? That's logical. <laughs> and that's a logical. See, everything in counter-racist codification is about the use of logic, which is what we haven't been using. That's why I say it's all personality-driven Yes, and, and emotion-driven. Even to... Today, on this program, Neely Fuller has been too animated, you might say, too emotional in answering some of the questions that are being asked. Now, that's my own judgment of myself. 
I have to check myself. And if I don't check myself, somebody needs to say, Mr. Fuller, you need to slow down and be more methodical and more logical in your delivery because you are adding to the confusion by your emotional responses. Now, some people might say I'm not being over overly emotional, but I say that I am. I should be like a, a like a robot. Mm. That's the way I would really like to answer these questions, just mm-hmm. like just like a machine, just like a computer. Mm-hmm. All right, why? Because it's exact. That's why. But when we let emotions get into our responses, even to answering questions like I do, I mean that is dangerous, and it is very unhealthy. And uh, so, yes, questions and answers. When people ask, say, or, or make a statement, you're asking too many questions. A professor might say that in a college. And you say, well, that's what I came here for, professor. I came here to ask questions and get answers. Otherwise, I have a question, another question, why am I here? If it's not about questions and answers. When you go to court in order to settle a case, it's all about what? If you've ever been to the courthouse, everything is about questions, answers, questions, answers, questions, answers. Where were you at 6 p.m. on October the 3rd, 1993? Take your time. See, that's a question. And sometimes a defense lawyer, for example, will say, don't answer that question. Why? Because questions always take everybody. If you keep getting answers to questions, it'll take everybody right where they should be. When you ask enough questions and get enough answers, the history of the universe has proven that everybody is taken right where everybody should be. If they ask enough questions and get enough answers, it won't take everybody where they want to be, like in a court of law. It's going to be some disgruntled people when you get all those questions answered, all right? And then it's going to be some people who are satisfied, but it's going to take everybody right where they should be because the truth always comes out through the process of questions and answers. Mm-hmm. And that's in, in making inventions or anything. Right. That's going to the moon. You've got to start with a question, and you've got to have an answer to that question. Otherwise, you ain't going to go to the moon, and you ain't getting back. Huh. Wow. All right. Thank you, uh, caller, for your uh, question. You. You're welcome. Okay, let's go to the Gmails. This comes from uh, Alpha, the first one. Um, he says, how to identify a white supremacist. He says, um, uh, Mr. Phil, I purchased the new book, and I'm waiting to purchase the Word Guide and the old book. I'm also donating to the second hour. Um, Thank you for that. Uh, Recently, Mr. Fuller, uh, it was revealed that uh, former President Obama and Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell were both descendants of slave owners. I find this information to be hurtful and confusing. On one hand, I can understand Mitch McConnell's situation. He is a, excuse me, he, okay, he is a suspected open white supremacist, but President Obama's history is confusing. Now people are saying the discovery of President Obama's possible slave owner family past uh, explains why he did not help black people while he was president. It appears Obama is a white supremacist or white supremacist sympathizer. Uh, this is the ideal confusion. Mr. Fuller, you often talk about the system of white supremacy works like a prison, and in the movie Shawshank Redemption is a good example of how the system works. I agree with you because in the movie, the characters resemble what is happening in real life. And he goes on about the warden and Boggs and Red and all this and all that kind of thing. He said the only 
one person left here is uh, the, with the question. It appears Andy Dufresne appears to represent the white people that do not believe in white supremacy. So here is the question. What, where does President Obama fit in the system? Yes, he is a non-white person, but all of his actions, in my view, have been to harm non-white people across the world. How do I identify, ID, a white supremacist? Well, is he asking me how, uh, how what's the well, correct, he, according to the code, he, what's the... Well, it has to be according to the code. He, he identified uh, the, is the What is the correct identity of President Barack Obama? Well, he did ask that. He said it appears to him, but he's also intimating that he could be wrong, but it appears to him, according to what Obama has done or did do while he was in office, did not help facilitate the cause of black people. And then he found out, and I don't know where he got his information, found out that in Obama's family that there appears to be uh, ownership of, of, of slaves, which explains why, uh, according to him, that why he did not help black people. So he was asking how to identify or ID a white supremacist. So the question is, how do you identify a white supremacist? Uh, that is correct. Oh, you identify a white supremacist by being, uh, according to the code, any person classified as white should be suspected of being a white supremacist if he or she is able to be one. Now, this is based on logic. But the person, first of all, has to be white to be a white supremacist. All non-white people are victims of white supremacy and prisoners of war. Here in 2019, we are prisoners of war. So just singling out any other black person as being a person that's uh, helping the system of white supremacy is fruitless simply because all victims of white supremacy, all prisoners of war, help to prop up the prison by being prisoners. And all prisoners of war are equal. The black people of this planet are prisoners of war. And we're all equal to each other. And it doesn't make any difference what our titles are. We don't have any power. There's any black person on the planet that has power to tell the white supremacists what they had better do, and the white supremacists have to do it. No black person on this planet called Earth can do that. Otherwise, there would be no such thing as white supremacy. There isn't a black person anywhere on this planet that can tell, stand up to the white supremacist world and say I'm telling you you had better do this and such according to me or else no black person has that kind of power if any black person shows that kind of power then that means that white supremacy doesn't exist that's what white supremacy means it means supreme over everybody who's black. No exceptions. Now, every now and then I've heard this word, some black people selling out other black person. You can't sell what you don't own. And every black person is owned by white supremacists. Every black person on the planet Earth in 2019 is owned by the white supremacist corporation. That's the name of that corporation, the system of white supremacy. And so you can't sell what you don't have. No black person can sell another black person out to the white supremacists because the white supremacists already have that black person that you call being bought or sold. Okay, uh, let's go to the phone lines. Uh, caller, you are now on with Mr. Fuller, and you can be heard. What is your question? Okay, uh, greetings. Greetings, Mr. Fuller and Mr. Bobby. Um, calling here from Texas. Uh, actually, Galveston. And I don't know if you guys have 
been uh, watching the, the news lately in regards to an image that was uh, really being circulated nationally. Uh, there was a a guy who was uh, mentally challenged, and he was uh, handcuffed and not really dragged, but guided by a rope and two uh, police officers on horses. Uh, have you seen this? I'm aware of it. Mr. Fuller, are you aware of it? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. All right. And, I, and I'm here, and, uh, you know, it's a bunch of, um, you know, commotion going on, and we actually have a, a, a meeting with um, the, the police chief. And I'm just curious, Mr. Fuller, to, to know what would your uh, advice be going into a meeting with the police chief? in talking about this incident. And I also have another question, too. That's just a small, you know, specific question. I have a big big picture question as well. Same thing you're doing now on this program. Go and ask them, is this the procedure for everybody? Is this going to be the procedure? Do they have a procedure? If they don't have a procedure for making an arrest, what is it? So you're asking questions. Or can they get one? Mm -hmm. All problems are solved. So you stay in the question lane. No shouting, no name calling, none of that. Do none of that. Stay in the question lane. Why? Because according to compensatory counter-racist logic, all problems are solved through the process of questions and answers. There are no exceptions in the universe to that concept. And so when you go and talk to the police chief or whomever, whoever the authority is, quote, unquote, it's nothing but questions, and you seek answers. And it should be endless questions. And don't interfere with the answers that you get. Just have the next question ready. Because if you interfere with the answer, you'll probably uh, be talking about what you think ought to be done. All right? But that's not what you're there for. You're there to see what they are willing to do and what they have planned to do. All right? And that you'll find that out by the answers that you get. Okay. Don't interfere with the answers. Just have the next question ready. That's the compensatory way. Okay. That's the counter-racist way. Okay. All right? And that's what I would do yes, if I was there yes, and I was in that setting. Okay. I would go in with nothing but questions and just record the questions and the answers. Yeah. The question, always get a record of the questions and the answers, but have hundreds of questions, if you can probably think of that many, that you think are necessary. And let them answer the questions. Let them what answer are, the questions. Okay, if they say, that, if the answer is, for example, well, we didn't really have a procedure, and that's why what happened happened. You say, all right, when can you get a procedure, and what will it be? And what's the deadline for having the procedure ready? I see what you're so saying. So that we can have something. So you want to be able to correct every situation that's not correct. Okay. And then yeah, shouting yeah. and name-calling, you won't make most mouth, uh, make most of the amount that you're looking for out of this. Yes, sir. But through the process of questions and answers, if somebody's trying to do something that they shouldn't be trying to do, that's going to come out mm -hmm. through the process of questions and answers. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. What's your second question, sir? Yeah. Yeah, okay. And second question is more of a, I guess, a, a wider scope question. Um, when it comes to, you know, him, uh, you, Mr. Fuller, talking a lot about, uh, you know, thought, speech, and action, and I think, you know, really deeply about this. And when it comes to, you know, the thought, speech, speech, speech and action, uh, when it comes to black people, you know, my question is, you know, ultimately, you know, when we look at these behaviors and these actions that are, uh, you know, done by black people, you know, who are, in your words, uh, poisoned, um, you know, and this is a tough question. I don't know. I hope it doesn't sound too bad. But um, because of these actions, is there a is there a rightful place 
for black people, you know, being where they are because of these thoughts and actions, you know, the things that people do. You know, I, I hear quite frequently, you know, you talk about the things that, you know, that, that we do that are not in line with what should be done. So for me, that says that, okay, if you have, you know, people that are doing things that are not in line with, you know, logic or the rules of the universe, then in essence, those people have a place, right? And some would say, you know, it's like a classroom. If you have a kid in class that's not following the rules and not doing the things that they're supposed to do, then, you know, they either, you know, put out or they, you know, go to the end of the line, you know, or wherever it is. So, uh, you know, what are your thoughts about that? You know, when it comes to, you know, doing the wrong thing, if you're doing the wrong thing all the time, then you're, is it right for your place you know, in the oh, oh. world to be at the bottom. Okay. Mr. Fuller, go ahead, please. Uh, I hope I understand the question. Yeah, because you did but ask a lot, try, of, a lot of things but, in there. But try to, yes, but to try to get right to the core, I think, according to the code, everything is divided into one of two, only two, nothing in between, categories. Constructive, non-constructive. Go ahead, Mr. Constructive. Fuller non-constructive that's all every move that every creature makes every minute of every day is going to have a constructive effect or a non-constructive effect and how do you know the difference between what's constructive and what's non-constructive by the effect if it if it corrects a problem then that's in a in a constructive manner in a manner where no one is harmed, that shouldn't be harmed, and that the person that gets the needs help the most gets the most constructive help, then that is constructive. That would be constructive. Anything other than that is non-constructive. You're talking about effect. So that's all you have to do in any situation. I mean, and you raise that question here, getting to that question again, you just say, sir, ma'am, in any situation, this thing that you're talking about doing, or this thing that you did, or this thing that you're going to do, is it going to have a constructive effect or a non-constructive effect? And if it's going to have a constructive effect, constructive how? Have them go into details. You have to have the details. And if it's going to have a non-constructive effect, well, the non-constructive effect will really show up anyway. But they can tell you. Okay. But they should be aiming for a constructive effect. You want an answer to that question? Yes, sir. Sir, ma'am, this thing that you're talking about doing, this proposal that you are going along with or that you initiated, is it going to have a constructive effect or a non-constructive effect? And if it's going to have a constructive effect, ma'am, sir, always be polite, how is it going to be constructive? Okay. In other words, you want to know what the results are before you all even, before you even go down that road. Okay. Um, before we talk about your book, Mr. Fuller, because it is time, I have just received a Gmail from one of our regular listeners, and according to the Gmail, he has sent an excerpt of your book, Mr. Nelly Fuller, Jr., of the United Independent Compensatory Code System Concept, said that he sent an excerpt of certain quotations of your book to the White House on racism. So uh, if this is a true statement, um, I'm not going to say that the White House is going to read it, but this gentleman had mentioned that an excerpt was sent to them along with the website where they can purchase the book. How about that, if this is true? So we will have to to, to see if um, what what's going on with that. I don't know what that means, or I don't know what it doesn't mean. But this is what I do know. It is at this time that we talk about your book. Talk to him at radio.com. We go where you go. Download the talk to him at radio.com. App to your cellar, to your tablet, this radio, the way it should be heard. My name is Mr. Bobby, co-host on the compensatory concept with Mr. Nearly Fuller. 
Jr. Our topic is um, today the Q&A with Mr. Fuller. But it is at this time where Mr. Fuller will talk about his book, where you can purchase it, any information about the formal book, any information that you feel is pertinent. Mr. Fuller, take it away. You can get the book by going to ProduceJustice.com. That's ProduceJustice.com. ProduceJustice.com. And what will come up on the screen is a brief description of the basic textbook, because that's the only one that's up there right now. The other books will be available in about three weeks. The original and the word guide. Uh, Right now we have a glitch in distribution. But the 2016 revised expanded edition is there at that site. Good. ProduceJustice.com. You can get it by going to that ProduceJustice.com and the book will be available there. And the book is designed for the individual person to become his or her own leader in doing what? Solving whatever problem you happen to have. That's what I wrote the book for. Whatever problem you're facing on a daily basis. Because the concept is, if you solve the problem of each and every individual black person on the entire planet, all of the non-white people, all of the victims of white supremacy on the planet, If you solve the problem of each individual person, you automatically have solved the problems of all of the persons on the planet. That's the concept. So you as an individual, you're only an individual. You're not, you're not really having any power over anybody else, but you got a little power for yourself. So the code book is designed to help the individual person without having to consult anybody about what to do. Look over your shoulder and look and see if anybody's with you. Uh, uh, Just go for yourself. Solve your own problem as best you can in the environment that you're in. That's what the book is written for. Okay. okay. Go to ProduceJustice.com. All right. Thank you, Mr. Fuller. Okay. Uh, This is from uh, the Gmails. It says this... um, Thank you, Mr. Fuller. Uh, When you get the old book and the word guide in stock, can you announce it? I work later hours, so sometimes I have to listen to the playback. Thank you. Uh, Many are comparing our current president with former President Reagan. I'm too young to know about the former President Reagan, so I did some research in the article, and I was reading about former President Reagan, and I found a definition of the word racist, and it is stated as follows. Racist, by definition, are people who use slurs, not people who make disciplinary policy to enrich their group. Question. According to the code, Mr. Fuller, does this definition of a racist is in agreement with the code? Could be and might not be, but I'll just go directly to what the code says flat out is racism. And what a racist is, a racist is a white supremacist, and a white supremacist is a racist. Why? Because in a world that's dominated by white supremacy, you only have a white supremacist as the only racist. There's no such thing as black supremacy and white supremacy in the same universe at the same time. It doesn't work that way. You can't have two supremes unless you're talking about a singing group or something like that. But if you're talking about racism... If you're talking about white supremacy, according to the code, it's just one supreme. And that is the white people, those white people, not all white people, but those white people who believe in and who practice non-justice against non-white people, those are white supremacists. And that's the only show in town. So racism is white supremacy. 
white supremacist racism. In fact, the only race of people, according to the code and according to logic, on the planet, the only race of people is the white race. There's no black race, yellow race, tan race, brown race. There's no race of people like that. That's the white supremacists saying that there is. But the white supremacists will say anything that will keep them in power, yeah. and that helps to keep them in power okay. because it's confusing. Mm -hmm. But the only race is the white race, okay. and they are white supremacists. All right. They practice racism. That's the only form of racism that exists on the planet in 2019 okay. is white supremacy. Uh, he goes on to say, Mr. Fuller, I tried to order the word guide, but the website still says the word guide is sold out. I really would appreciate a clear definition on the words racist and racism because I am confused with how the news media is using these words. Thank you very much, Mr. Fuller. Well, it's your option to accept it or reject how the so-called quote-unquote news media, because now it comes down to what's the definition of the news media? Is Neely Fuller part of the news media? Does Neely Fuller say anything that's new? And what do you mean by new and media? Mm -hmm. See, words are very important. Right. All right, so you take every word apart. Okay. Now, if someone says news media, which is something I don't do, by the way, I don't use the term news media. Why? Because I don't know what it means. <laughs> and if anybody says, I'm the news media, I'm going to ask them, because the code says all problems are solved through what? Questions and answers. Questions and answers. Mm -hmm. Anybody who comes to me and say, hi, I'm the news media. Okay. I'm going to say, wait a minute, sir. What do you mean by news? And what do you mean by media? And what do you mean by you? Or the news media. Oh, okay. Those are three questions uh, uh, before we get any further. Any further. I want to make sure of who I'm talking to and what all that means. Okay. I'm the news media. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> uh, be, yeah, before we go on here, here here's, here's one that might be right in here. It says, greetings, Mr. Fuller. Part of the code reminds us to pay close attention to words that are used by everyone, especially suspected racist white supremacists. The system of racist white supremacists may change certain words, but does the intent of the words used to change? But what is the intent of the words used? Uh, change. I'm hearing a lot more, quote, white nationalism, end of that quote thought, though I have yet to hear a definition of the phrase instead of white supremacy. Another observation, Mr. Fuller, in less than 48 hours, I'm hearing some people say the shooters suffered from, quote, mental illness, end of that quote. Does anyone say any of the suspected shooters in Chicago are suffering from mental illness? Dr. Francis Cress Welsing says we are all suffering from mental illness, especially the victims of racism, white supremacy. Mr. Fuller? Yes, I say that in my textbook. But I'm talking from Neely Fuller's perspective. Because, see, I explain the words that I use. So what does the code say? When anybody uses a term... You don't think about what you mean when you say it. Think about what they mean when they say it. And how are you going to think about what another person means when they say anything? How are you going to find out what that person means? Through the process of what? Questions and answers. Questions and answers. So if a person says, hey, the persons who did this and that and the other is mentally ill, sir, ma'am, my question is, what do you mean when you say that that person that you are talking about is, quote, mentally ill? What do you mean? Give me the definition according to you, since you're doing the talking. See, everybody might have their own definition. That's where you have what? Confusion. Confusion. 
confusion. All right. So the way to get rid of confusion is through the process of doing what? Questions and answers. Questions and answers. Just ask them. Ask the person doing the talking. Regardless of what everybody else says, the person doing the talking, if they use the term mentally ill, you say, hold it right there, sir, so that we all be on the same page, meaning I understand what you're saying and you understand what I say when I say what I got to say. Now, I want to know what you mean, sir, or ma'am, or whomever it is, what you mean when you say or when you use the term mentally ill. Yes. What is your definition? Yes. And don't interfere with their answer. Yes. You already know what you think. Yes. But you want to know what they are saying. Yes. Because when I looked at the account of that, that question was not asked. Uh, What do you mean when you say mental ill? You're right, Mr. Fuller. That question was not asked. So I don't know what that means. It's the the same as the term white nationalism and all that. What do you mean? You say, well, we're not white supremacists. We are white nationalists. Yeah, what the hell is that? If I'm talking to a person and, and, and that person makes a statement according to the code, I'm duty bound to say, okay, uh, just a moment, sir, if you don't mind. What do you mean when you say white supremacists? And what do you mean when you say white nationalists? Wow. And what is the difference between the two? That's why we have to speak in codification. Mr. Fuller. Uh, Keep asking questions, folks. Everybody out there. Yes, sir. Ask questions. Have a million of them ready. All right. Mr. Fuller, my callers or callers, thank you so much for calling in. Talk team at radio.com, the world's greatest radio, radio the way it should be heard. Thank you again, Mr. Fuller. Thank you, callers. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Thanks for listening to The Compensatory Concept with Mr. Neely Fuller, heard exclusively on TalkTainmentRadio.com, the world's greatest radio. The most important question in all racial matters is why one should always ask it. Radio, the way it should be heard. You got the power. The world's greatest radio. TalkTainmentRadio.com.